Let's talk about the concept that humans are addicted to suffering. Because I, I think I want people to understand how, how that really works. So can you go deep into that? Well, it is reward and punishment. That's how we get domesticated. Mm -hmm. And some people get domesticated with abuse and fear that they're paralyzing themselves. And then what happens when we grow up is that we begin to abuse ourselves. We begin, you know, being our active domesticator of, you know, of negativity. And that's why, you know, you can see the television is having, you know, barbaric scenes and we're just eating, eating, watching all that, you know, yeah. as we eat food, we're watching these mm -hmm. things. Or we get the heartbreak and we right away look for heartbreak songs to make ourselves feel less than. And then we complain about our life with people. And, you know, and complaining has to do a lot because we master complaining in the addiction of suffering. You know, we complain about our life, but we don't do a, we don't lift a finger. We just stick there because who are we with our pain? And they say that to have love, you have to have pain first. And, you know, we believe that. So we go through all these trails and now it comes for the biggest, you know, abuser. That's one of the religions, They're not the true heart religion of the heart of the divinity, but the man manipulating, you know, suppressing that automatic coldness of machismo that I call that is never going to be enough. That is a factory of, you know, falling messengers. And the message that is falling is to hurt one another, to go a war against one another. And then it became the war of the gods. And the war of the god is not necessarily with Zeus or Quetzalcoatl, you know. It's with humanity, who is right, who is wrong. And they fight to the death. And even families, you know, with politics, with, you know, sports, with, you know, anything, they begin agitating themselves and using the word against themselves. And you can see right there, there's no respect for one another because we all are different. We all enjoy the same thing. We don't have to prove ourselves from other things. So when we begin now hurting people to hurt ourselves, that is the addiction of suffering, and it changes a lot. You know, I see many cultures say that they love Divine Mother, but, you know, this, for me, my physical body, even though I'm male, this is part of the planet. This is Divine Mother. And many people say that they love Divine Mother, but they treat Divine Mother horribly by believing in lies. And, you know, the moment that we begin freeing ourselves from ourselves and we have the, that minimal potential, minimal opportunity to have that reflection to change our life. We have two choices. We continue, you know, the nightmare, or we change our dream because we can change our life when we want to. But the thing is about detaching. And that's what many people cannot do in addiction, no matter what the kind of addiction it is. When they're not ready, they cannot let the addiction go. But when something happens and say, okay, I want to see again. And it's when I was blind, but I wasn't talking about seeing with my eyes. I was seeing with my heart, I want to live again. So from that point on, I begin seeing my own life like an autopsy. Now seeing where I lost power, the lies that I defended. And it's difficult because it's, it hurts, but an operation also hurts. And to recovery, it takes time. But when time gives you that healing, and this is when many people are in a hurry or they want another operator, a doctor to operate them, when you are the one who should do the operation. Yeah. Do you believe that there has to be pain and suffering in the world for us to understand love? Or do you believe that we can all heal and there could be a world where there's the, no addiction to suffering? I believe that it could be a world with no addiction to suffering. But our ancestors and their ancestors and their ancestors created suffering and get manipulated by the suggestion of the word of what should be, especially, you know, the dream of hell and heaven, which for me is not real. Heaven and hell is not after we die, it's in this life. Yeah. That's why it's important to know the two masteries of what is real, life and death. When you know life and death, it is the only reality and not the language and the knowledge, because that's what people are attached to and afraid to let go. Just think about it. It's scary to think that we're not going to think all the time, that one day we're not going to have this interaction of speaking to one or being present. So people begin feeling that, that they can believe any lies to keep them, including I've seen times that people go to different traditions and they say, you know, no matter what you do right now, you pray, you do things, you're paying for the lifetime of the past today and your next life will be better. And, you know, that, that's a manipulation there, right, too. Because there is no past life. 
there's energy, yes, but there is no Jose that was before this Jose, and there will be not a Jose after I die. Mm -hmm. That is something like a bandage to, to people who are afraid of dying. And if one people is afraid of dying, then here comes a religion, here comes a belief system. And people run away from one to another, not realizing they are in the war of the gods. But when you surrender, you like all the religions because you respect them all. And you see the gems in all of them, and you're not debating anything because you're just here visiting the dream of humanity. Because like one of my favorite things that I like about the four agreements is the story that one says, imagine you're the only sober person in a world where everybody's completely drunk. Do, why waste your time talking to the drunk yeah. people? Yeah. But you enjoy them. Mm -hmm. If you have family and friends who live like that, they're still alive, you enjoy them. But I do a little, met a little metaphor for myself. I imagine that I have a scuba, a scuba gear and an oxygen tank. And if they start talking about negative or politics or anything, you know, that gives me, you know, reacting. I said, okay, my oxygen tank is getting low. I have to get out of the water and breathe again to my own dream. And this yeah. is something that we all have, our own dream. Yeah, that, that was something I was going to ask you because even though you're healing yourself, it's hard to interact and live in a world that still has so much suffering. You see all the wars, you see the news, you see, it, it's it's hard not to get sucked into the fear and the negative emotions. So how do you protect yourself and how do you he heal yourself in this environment? It's be present and see that's happening, but not lose ourselves in the reaction. In the reaction, when we get upset or mad, we don't see clearly anymore and a side has gotten us to fight another side. But if we think from the point of view that everybody's our children, just imagine that your two kids are fighting but they're fighting for something that is pointless. You love them both. And sometimes they don't see that. But little by little, by seeing your presence, that is contagious, that is not fighting, that is peaceful, they will see something inside of you. And when they're ready, spinning their wheels, fighting, they know that it doesn't go anywhere. They will ask the question, is there more than life than this? Then the authentic self is so contagious that, you know, like reading a good book, like the Four Agreements, I, I, I know this information because it's integrity talking to integrity, but this makes me feel better living this way of life instead of living by the art of war. Mm -hmm. Because in the art of war, it's always fighting, always wanting to be right, always debating. But in the other dream, you can just have peace. You know, I've talked to the most nicest racist because I would respect, I can have a conversation, even though I know what they see me. But for me, it doesn't matter. I'm just stepping into a belief that I know is not real for me. And then I go to another belief, another belief, and all these people can go against each other. But when you enter them with respect, they speak to you. And this is something that, you know, this world lacks of respect. Especially imagine there's all these artists that disrespect themselves, which is the best. Well, there's no better or worse. It's just art. Yeah. So you're saying that you keep coming to this concept of respect. You think all we need to do is to respect each other and that we could be more peaceful that way. Well, yes, because let's imagine we respect ourselves. Like, let, I respect myself that this is not the marriage for me. In that moment, I would take a part of big suffering in my life and make peace with myself and bring that peace to me. And that's with everything. When we begin respecting ourselves, it's like pouring the cup in the glass and the respect will just build out because yeah. that's where we live. But if we don't respect ourselves, we cannot respect other people because something that they do, they may trigger us. And we have to defend in order to be right. But when you respect yourself, you don't care to be right or wrong. Even I say to my father, it's strange. I love to be judged. And he laughed. Why? It's because when I judge, I feel it taking it personally, but I don't believe it. But I can create a new story to share. A new chapter for a new book. Mm -hmm. Because a revelation of someone who's sick with addiction or suffering is inspiring me to make some medicine in my heart, in my words, to create a story that will reflect to that person or another person what does dance do? Yeah. Why don't we go through all the agreements, like the four agreements and the fifth agreement? Because I, I, well, the four agreements is one of my favorite books of all time. I have read the fifth agreement as well, which is really good. So for the listeners, let, let's just give them your summary <laughs> of them. Yes, well, the first of one is to be in pickle with your word. And what does that mean? It's like the magic wand. Word creates stories. 
let's say I say a dream, I make an intent. And with that, with that word, I can create a story for myself. I'm going to school. I'm going to learn this. I'm going to go to a public place and speak from the heart. And, you know, I create a belief system of what I want to do. And that creates now knowing if I'm using the word against myself, which when I'm not in pick up my word saying, I'm not good, I'm not doing my best, why even try? You begin using your word like magic instead of being a scorpion singing so with his own tail, you know, poisoning itself. You use the word to lift up, to raise your intent and to make what is not possible, possible. Mm -hmm. And the second agreement, do not take things personal, which was one of the hardest for me because I took myself personal all the time. But the moment that I begin not taking myself personal and respecting my way of thinking, I begin seeing other people, especially the people who scream at me, who are negative at me, you know, instead of fighting them back, I just saw them, you know, these people, you're asking for help, but they do not know how to ask for help because they're blinded by hate and anger in that moment because that creates a hangover. Let's say they do something evil, they do something negative to people they love, the next day they will wake up with resentment or I mean, regret, I mean, with regret and the other one to do it again. And this is what happens in relationships. They hurt people and then I never do it again and they hurt people. But the moment that you don't take things personal, you begin cleaning your space because no one has the right to, you know, say those things to you and you don't have the right to say that back to them. So in that moment, you clean your space, not taking anything personal, like just like Siddhartha did when they threw the arrows Mara threw the arrows, the fire ones, and he turned them into roses. He turned all those opinions, all the judgment, because he didn't believe in them. Then even they didn't feel them. Of course, we feel that we begin protecting ourselves from ourselves with this dance. And here comes the other one. Do not make assumptions. Do not project what other people do without asking them the question of what they're feeling. Because in the addiction of suffering, even if they laugh, they think they're laughing at us, but they're not laughing at us. But we make the assumption they're laughing at us. So imagine what we do when people say things or make opinions. We make assumptions, oh, look at me, they're hurting me. And then we are afraid to speak with word. When we don't make assumptions, we give respect to other people to create their own art and things like that. And when we want to, okay, let's have a conversation. Did you mean this and that? And they will say no or yes. You know, that clears the space. Mm -hmm. And this is the important thing that we respect one another in relationships or in friendships. It has the opportunity to conversate and clean this this space. And many people are afraid, are nervous. You know, they prefer gossip than actually speak. Do you say this to me? You know, they prefer, it's, it's not in fighting words. It's just like to clean the space because you want people in your life. And for some people, you don't care to have that conversation because if they did it once, you know, you don't have that investment to have them in your life. So, you know, you choose. Now it comes the fourth one. Is my father's favorite ag agreement. Why? Because without the fourth one, none of them will exist. And he's always doing your best. And for me, when I do my best, how can I judge myself? How can I say I didn't do enough when I gave it my best? And this is one of the important things to do in life. When we do our best, like when we're 20, sometimes we judge ourselves. Oh, I wish I was 20 so I can change everything. No. When I was 20, I did my best in that time. And 25, I did my best. Now, 20 years later, I'm doing my best in 45. And that's all I could do. Yeah. And uh, the fifth agreement, you know, that was very special for me because when my father was in the, in, in the hospital, before he went to a nine-week coma, I asked him, How, what's the best way that I can repay you? And, and he said, you know, take care of my son, you know, and uh, be skeptical, but learn to listen. And from that point on, he went to a nine-week coma at first, I thought I was being skeptical of the outside, you know, opinions and things like that. But no, the fifth agreement is to be skeptical of my own negativity, to be skeptical of my own poison. Let's say I, I cannot do this interview. I cannot, you know, make a book. You know, if I'm skeptical to that, then I give myself the permission to make an interview, to write a book. Yeah. So it comes a moment that we're skeptical of our own poison. And when we do that, practice makes him master. And we're mastering ourselves, not other people. We're mastering our own voice of knowledge to not use it against ourselves, which goes back to the first agreement, to be impeccable with our work. And then from this on, there's nothing to do. There's just to enjoy life and recreate our dream, recreate our life how we want to. That's why sometimes we pass through two marriages or, you know, 
40 years, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. We have to experience life to see what gives us pleasure or what does not, because it doesn't have to do with religion either or mystery school spirituality. It's just about life. It's about common sense. And when you wake up that artist inside of you, then you drop what we call in the Totec tradition, the human form is what we believe we are. Like for many people, I am Jose, but I know that's just a name given to me in my story. And I don't even believe my story. <laughs> 